Welcome to the MIT Center for Art, Science, and Technology's 2021 Symposium, Unfolding Intelligence, the Art and Science of Contemporary Computation. CAST was established in 2012 with the goal of building and building on connections between the worlds of art, science, and technology. This is the third in a series of symposia that CAST has convened since then, and as with its predecessors, we bring together artists, scientists, engineers, and humanists from within MIT and from the world at large to discuss areas of rapidly evolving research and urgent social relevance, and to find in that dialogue stimulation, confirmation, provocation, intersection, and we hope common purpose. At MIT, CAST partners with departments, labs, and centers to integrate the arts across the curriculum to enrich and encourage artistic collaboration and to provide support to faculty and members of the MIT community as they pursue their own artistic practice and or research. In addition to symposia like this, CAST facilitates the sharing of this creative work beyond the Institute by producing concerts, exhibitions, and publications and making them available to the public. So thank you for being with us today. We hope you will join us throughout the week at virtual events addressing the aesthetic, technical, and critical issues pertaining to artificial intelligence and computational media. We also look forward to seeing you on Friday, April 9th, as the symposium culminates with a live interactive event to which all attendees are invited and in which you can join presenters and artists in breakout rooms to explore hidden threads between all that has been discussed this week. Hi, I'm very glad to be with you today to talk about the Generative Unfoldings exhibit. I'm Nick Monfort, and I want to introduce my colleague, Fox Harrell from MIT here. Lauren Lee McCarthy from UCLA, and Sarah Rosalena Brady from UC Santa Barbara. Uh, also, I want to extend thanks to Parag Mittal, who couldn't be with us for this conversation today, but all of us participated in the conversation about how to select works for commissions for this project. And uh, this project uh, manifests itself as a generative art exhibit with works running in the browser, um, but also is a free software exhibit that allows people to study, uh, fork, distribute, rework um, any of the projects uh, that have been done in it. Um, and uh, this is all thanks to the Center for Art, Science and Technology here at MIT. And in relation to the generative, uh, this uh, generative unfoldings exhibit is in relation to the Unfolding Intelligence Symposium. We weren't able to do what we've done in the past with symposia, bring people physically to campus, have uh, panels and good in-person engagement. So we decided to reach out to the community of artists and bring some of their work online in ways that it could live in the browser and run in the browser, um, but it could also be part of future uh, collaborations and uh, work with projects of uh, uh, generative sorts. Um, so um, maybe the best question to start off with in, in relation to the artworks themselves, the commissions that we awarded and the pieces that we ended up with here um, is about uh, what generative art exactly is. Because I think there's a stereotype or a concept of generative art. Um, it's, uh, it's a new concept that we have. It's not like painting or sculpture that's been around with us for centuries, but uh, there's already some type of uh, typical idea of what uh, generative art is. And one of the things that excites me about the show is that it's certainly not unrelated to that idea, but I think there's a lot of interesting variation and diversity in the works that we see. Um, maybe I'll ask um, Lauren if you'd like to talk about what generative art um, maybe has been more typically or has been thought of and um, if you see trends in the show that um, challenge or expand that in some interesting ways. Sure. Um, I, I mean, I think generative art is, in the most basic sense could be thought of as art that's 
made with code and that is constantly generating or constantly um, uh, making a new form with itself, right? So it's different than uh, a video or an image where it's a closed work that you could loop or, or view multiple times, but it always stays the same. So with a generative work, there's a um, quality of liveness where it's always changing and, and um, often like it, you might see an iteration that's never been seen before in the playthrough of the work because um, it's live running software. However, I think that in the past that the uh, our conception of what might fit into generative art has been more limited in terms of the sorts of aesthetics that we're seeing or the types of um, uh, uh, moves or, or techniques used with code. And I think what's interesting about this exit, you know, and it, it, often it's focused a lot on the very visual formal realm of things. And I think what's really exciting about this exhibition is that it really spans a wide range of media and techniques. And that, you know, it's hard to find works that actually even look very similar to each other. They all kind of go in really different directions. Yeah, that's definitely one of the things that I noticed. Um, and uh, in fact, from my own uh, standpoint, as someone who has a practice as a poet and is involved with uh, text and language particularly, um, it's interesting, maybe I just attracted those types of submissions, or maybe uh, that was something that came out of my being part of the conversation and so forth. But, you know, there's nine works by my count where um, text is a really important aspect of that, nine of the 14. Um, uh, and that uh, is compatible with an idea of generative art, obviously, but uh, not something that uh, we imagine in maybe the stereotypical sort of um, uh, geometric play of uh, shapes you know, running by themselves. Um, and I should say also, speaking of things that run by themselves, um, that's an idea that um, is not uh, absolutely defining in generative art, but you know, I, I recently was, was teaching from Margaret Bowden and Ernest Edmonds book, Fingers to Digits, and they, they define this concept of CG art, you know, giving everything a, a name and the typology. And so this is the, 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 the you know, uh, this is what we really mean by generative art here. And the standard central example of that is, you know, stuff that runs by itself. So they, they don't preclude things that are interactive, but you really should, the piece should really run by itself, you know, if it really definitely wants to be uh, uh, generative art. And so we also have lots of stuff that's interactive. Um, and that's interesting to me that, um, and you know, there's some things where interactivity is optional. Um, uh, there's some things uh, that, uh, that do run, but allow for intervention. Um, uh, did you wanna make any comments, uh, say Fox, about um, uh, that aspect or another aspect of the artworks themselves in the exhibit? Yeah, I think that both uh, Lauren and you have made such uh, great points here. One of the things that I can add, you know, in addition to the computer generated aspect of this kind of work, is looking at it in our historical context. So for me, it relates not only to works that run autonomously or computationally, but also trends in other forms of art, such as conceptual art, forms of conceptual art, such as instruction art, works within literary practice, such as from the group uh, Lipo, you know, doing experimental rule-constrained work and more. And so when I think back to conceptual and uh, instruction-based artwork, I see a similar kind of difference where you have some works that are very formally focused, like Solowitz's work, for example, tends to be highly formal, but you also have artists such as Adrian Piper or Yoko Ono that do work that in one case is more politically engaged and uh, socially engaged, in another case, I would say is more poetically and socially engaged uh, too, yeah, in, in terms of, uh, say, Yoko Ono's instruction art for paintings, you know, that cut a hole in a canvas, hold it up to a sky, you know, this kind of uh, work. And so I think the idea of instructions, you know, that will be used to generate some work, whether they're actually implemented or, or just conceptual, I think is quite related to this kind of show. And this idea that we have artists that work in a poetic vein, in a socio-political vein, and uh, more using instruction-based or algorithmic techniques is something that's unique about this particular show. I should say, at least, is underrepresented compared to a lot of generative artwork that tends to be more formally focused. Yeah, I think there's a range of work, some of which is quite overtly engaged with 
um, the uh, power and susceptibility of the gays with surveillance, um, uh, even with, uh, with uh, sort of self-doubting and questioning and things like this, um, and um, uh, other pieces that complicate um, the uh, highly formalist sorts of projects of, of generative art. Um, those are a few of the trends, you know, that, that um, I noticed uh, in the artwork that maybe make this different than, you know, the, the overall stereotype. Um, Sarah, do you want to add to that from your perspective in terms of how the artworks look to you? Yeah, no, and I completely agree with Fox. Saw a lot of relationship between, you know, Dada and Fluxus um, and how a lot of the works that we chose, you know, uh, include this kind of like formal instruction as a way to produce. Um, but, you know, because we're looking this, you know, in the future and also focusing more on the terms of AI, um, a lot of this is pointed towards um, language and decision making towards the unknown, uh, which I think is so interesting. This idea of generative art or generative unfoldings is how you know, these works um, also try to understand what's hidden um, because what their output is an emergent form. Um, and I find that is really important when we, you know, when we have these really complex conversations about, you know, how, you know, these, these artworks are gonna be shaping um, our future and how it could be more inclusive. And, you know, I, that again goes back to this lineage of, you know, how this idea of, you know, this output of something emergent um, is really unique and special because it can really um, get to the core root of what we don't see and what is unknown and also have the own unknown and things that are alien um, have power. Um, and I'm curious what you guys think too. Yeah, yeah I, could, I mean, uh, go ahead, Lauren, please. Yeah, I, I just wanted to add, I think one thing I noticed with this, with the exhibition, the selected works was that we're talking about these generative systems, which is software, but the human is really present in a lot of the pieces. And Nick, you were mentioning the, the language coming through. And I think that for me, that reads as a part of it, you know, that um, there's a real questioning of, okay, so we have these systems around us. What is, how do we interact with them as, as humans? How are they shaping us as society? Um, you know, in what ways is that moving us towards a future that we do or don't wanna see, you know, to speak to Sarah's point too. Yeah, I, I think I, also, I, you know, oh, go, go ahead, Fox, actually, please. Oh, I was just going to add, you know, that, I mean, I've been long interested in how AI and other kinds of expressive systems encode society's phantasms, you know, that is in terms of the social, the mental, the sensory imagery that we engage with that encode, that encodes worldview of all different types, including bias. And one of the terms that's come into common parlance these days is algorithmic bias. You know, that's a, you know, that, that's a kind of concern that we have with AI in general, not just uh, anxiety. It's something that's a real concern, especially as we've moved more towards artificial neural network based uh, systems as being prevalent. So I think that a lot of what Sarah is speaking about is about that kind of, uh, you know, that kind of implicit information that gets built into these kinds of uh, systems. But what I love about this particular set of works is that it's not only about those kind of issues around algorithmic bias in the abstract, but it's engaging with notions such as feminist theory or notions like the subaltern and critique of hegemony you know, from cultural studies and related kind of uh, you know, research areas and representations and theories of gender and uh, so much more along with the formal. And so I feel like that's something which is especially powerful is to leverage this generative algorithmic data structural kind of approach engage deeply with AI, but for these kind of issues, feminism, so the subaltern, gender, and identity, and, and society, politics, and so much more. Yeah, I think the range of uh, topics and um, issues of cultural relevance that are taken on um, is quite impressive. Uh, and also the fact that these aren't just works that sort of use a single artistic method to like do AI to uh, everything in the same way. They relate to you know, visualizing, um, to uh, textualizing, uh, to collaging, uh, to using a, a variety of different processes uh, related to the way we think about AI. 
um, as it pertains to these other cultural phenomena. Um, but maybe we should talk some about um, the human beings, not just the uh, computational techniques that are involved with these pieces because they're made by artists. And um, I think we have an interesting range of artists. I don't wanna be too quantitative like we often are at MIT and try to list you know, um, right now how many countries and uh, things like that. Uh, but I, uh, I do think it's intriguing that we have people at uh, different stages of their work. Um, some uh, who are doing really the first sort of project as an art, as an art duo, some of whom have quite uh, mature practices and have made uh, many different contributions in generative art. Um, we have people associated um, with um, different schools and programs. Um, and we have people who um, uh, come to this from um, uh, many, many different uh, perspectives, um, work individually in some cases, uh, collaborate in other cases. Um, what do you all think about the um, uh, particular set of artists and um, artist duos that we have represented um, and that have actually put together this work that we're looking at? Does anyone want to offer some comments on uh, the people behind the artwork and what new sorts of trends we see there? Um, one thing that I was thinking about was how these works fit into the practice of the artists. Um, so I noticed for some, some works, uh, you know, th this work that they have in the exhibition is part of kind of a long series of works in this direction that they've um, been making. And then for others, it's actually a first um, or an early, you know, one of the first forays into generative art or making something that's primarily web or software based, maybe coming from a practice that's more based in sculpture or um, video or other media. So I think that that was really exciting to see. And I wonder how much of it also had to do with with the pandemic in general and the fact that a lot of artists are questioning and thinking about how their practices, um, you know, live in this virtual space. But I think because of that, there is a really nice energy here where there are, um, you know, the works are building on communities or libraries that exist. So there, it's very tied to kind of longstanding collaborative traditions in making generative art. But there's also this kind of energy of, of um, you know, new exploration and, and new experiments that feels very tangible in a lot of the works. Yeah, maybe I should also ask that we say a little bit about our own creative practices, which, which we all have. Um, we uh, all come to this as artists of uh, some sort, and um, we also have our, our academic affiliations under our belt and so forth. Um, and, uh, you know, I mentioned that I do identify as a poet, and my work is definitely um, focused on language. But uh, for me, even more computation is important to what I do. So creative computing of various sorts, often dealing with language, is uh, central to my sort of approach. Um, Sarah, will you tell us some about your art practice and its relationship to generative art? Yeah, so I actually teach yeah, computational so craft, um, which is a, a really unique way of deconstructing and materializing technology. Um, but I really use it, you know, such as like AI and all these emergent forms of making as a way to really break down and open up these systems for new possibilities and have new conversations because um, just because the historical root of computation and code rooted in the military and colonialism, it's really important that we continue to have these conversations and involve because these partial perspectives create objective vision. So we need to constantly be including arts and humanities and forcing the machine to think outside the box. And I feel like I like what Lauren just said, like this is the perfect moment. I feel like people are really starting to be aware of the systems that they participate in because of the pandemic, um, because technology has been the crucial platform for this whole, uh, you know, uh, perspective, um, including, you know, us talking over Zoom. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think that's really important because um, we're going to have to um, break these systems in many ways. And art, you know, has always done that. 
And that's why, because um, art and technology really do co-evolve with each other. Yes, um, and the moment for this investigation, it's not just an opportunity to um, invite some artists uh, to put some things online, although I think it is, um, but it is a, a real reflective moment in dealing with art and uh, computing. Fox, tell us some about um, your engagement as, uh, um, as an artist, as well as um, your other roles as a computer scientist, for instance. Sure, I'd be happy to. Yeah, so I think the way that I approach this kind of work is looking at the computer as a medium, and then more specifically, certain types of techniques, like AI-based techniques, looking at the way that meaning is represented and encoded within computational systems, and then leveraging it for expression, especially narrative, narrative imagining, you know, this, you know, this type of work that uh, has the kind of coherence you know, in terms of time, in terms of causality and so forth, but really engaged with social issues, you know, with genre and other forms of uh, fiction you know, at, the same, at the same time. And so to make that more concrete is to think about ways that say an author in uh, genre fiction might leverage fantasy or diverse forms of the, you know, the imaginary for social critique in really precise ways. And I think about works not in one particular kind of uh, genre or one particular medium, but works that have that kind of quality uh, across them. So that could be work like in literature, Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, which I feel is one of the greatest works of sociology. It just happens to be in the form of a highly metaphorical work of literature, but also people like Italo Calvino, I think, who uses highly formal approaches to get really lush poetic kind of uh, prose you know, within the work. And people like, let's say, Charles Mingus or Anita Simone that leverage you know, both compositional strategies along with political engagement to make really sometimes incendiary and incisive social statements. So I really look for those kind of qualities. It takes the form sometimes of their games you know, that, that are pushing the expressive potential of you know, computational games medium, sometimes immersive environments such as in uh, virtual reality, and uh, sometimes novel forms that incorporate aspects of all of those you know, that uh, but might not be anticipated by just some of those uh, conventional labels. Yeah, and when you came to MIT, the lab you founded is the Imagination, Computation, and Expression Lab. And this idea that computing can be expressive uh, and uh, imaginative can offer the phantasms um, that allow us to uh, work toward a better society uh, is a very compelling one. Um, a lot of my work is not so expressive. It's not much about the things I wish to express, but it's more about a uh, conceptual or cool sort of engagement with language and computation, which I hope then resonates in a really compelling and interesting way because of all of the cultural histories and linguistic histories and histories of computing that it can't help but bounce up against. Um, but let me give Lauren a chance to tell us some. I'm really eager to hear her speak about her artwork as well. Sure. Um, yeah, my practice is very grounded in performance and software, but it spans a range of media. And I'm really captivated by the ways that, you know, we're taught to interact with algorithms. And then by extension, that kind of shapes the way we interact with each other. So very central to the work is a critique of the, you know, both, simul uh, the both technical and social systems that we're building around ourselves and kind of poking at and questioning what, what are these rules and what happens when we introduce glitches. Um, so to give some examples, I'm, I'm often creating performances that have some viewer engagement. So it's, you know, asking people to remote control my dates or um, offering to be their real life follower or um, uh, providing a service where I, acting in their home as a human Amazon Alexa. Um, so I'm kind of making these performances um, in which we both enter into the system and uh, try to navigate and understand our roles within it. And then hopefully by extension, maybe understand some of the, the larger systems around us. And I think each, you know, it, each one of these feels like um, 
an attempt, like I'm, I'm trying to almost embody a machine or understand the distance between the mm -hmm. algorithm and myself or the distance between others and me. And there are kind of these, these breakdowns in that process. Um, and then I'll, just a lot of questions, you know, who builds these artificial systems and what values do they embody? Who's prioritized and who's targeted when, you know, as we're talking about biases programmatically encoded? And then what are the boundaries around our intimate spaces? And in the midst of all these network interfaces, what does it mean to be truly present with one another? Um, so those are the questions I'm thinking about, but often there's there's a high degree of just awkwardness and, um, <laughs> and ambiguity in, in these moments I'm trying to create. Yeah. And well, I know that one of the concerns you and I share, not just you and I, but I think all four of us is uh, that of enabling people to, uh, be creative, conceptual, imaginative, expressive uh, with computing. And um, we've talked about this in the past. You don't think of maybe P5JS, or the last time we talked, uh, you didn't think of P5JS sort of as like part of your art artistic practice, but it's a very significant project related to generative art and um, uh, enabling really of a community of people online who are able to exchange and deal with their work. And the, this really leads on to uh, the last big topic that I wanted us to talk about some. We talked about the artworks a little bit. We talked about artists a little bit. Um, but there's also these communities and groups that um, this production comes from. It's not just someone um, sitting alone on a computer coming up with an idea and putting it up on the web. Um, so can you tell us some, um, doesn't have to be about P5JS exclusively, but certainly that's a really intriguing project I, I'd love to hear more about. Can you tell us some about these uh, communities of uh, computational art production from your perspective, Lauren? Yeah, um, I guess I don't think of it, like you said, as part of because I completely forgot in the last question to mention it. But um, yeah, I mean, it's very related, right? Um, and I think what I love about your question just now is you asked about the communities and use the word community rather than tool. So I think a lot of what we're seeing is groups of artists coming together and collaboratively making tools or methodologies or practices between themselves where they're sharing bits of code or different techniques. Um, you know, P5 is, is one example, but there's many others. Um, but I, I think your focus on community is so right on and, and what's really apparent in, in the works of these artists in the exhibition too, that, um, you know, it's one thing to have an open source piece of code that, you know, might get shared or, or used. And I think it's another to build a space around that and to be really intentional about, you know, who is welcomed here? Um, how are we thinking about using technology? How are we thinking about collaboration? How are we building structures as a community towards a future um, that is more inclusive or that is um, more supportive of artists and the sorts of practices we wanna have. So yeah, it's, it's really exciting to see a lot of the artists in this exhibition using open source tools. And the fact that these works will also be open source means that others can build on them and it can be part of that ongoing conversation and community. Yes, although as you point out, just having the code up by itself, right, doesn't sort of, make a community happen around it, um, it can be an ingredient to that, right? So in the open source world, there's um, you know, a festival in uh, Bergen, Norway called Pixel, um, which is exclusively for open source artwork uh, that's done with computing. And, um, and so there are these um, opportunities, these communities that, um, uh, that maybe aren't tied to um, specific uh, software tools, platforms, works. And then there's also software tools that, um, uh, or platforms um, where uh, people sharing their work, discussing it, coming up with things, you know, um, is really important. So there's the system Twitter, which is really like a very, very lightweight um, sort of addition to JavaScript, like a few sort of abbreviations of, you know, the math.cosine and things like that. And, um, uh, the as a technical feat, it's not that great, you know. But uh, what it's done is it's enabled people to make these concise, you know, tweet length programs, share them with each other, 
and um, have uh, conversations and build community around there. Uh, people do that with P5JS also. Um, uh, but um, th these are the aspects that I find um, really intriguing. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm wondering, uh, uh, Sarah, from your perspective, if you have um, some sorts of uh, communities engaged with generative art, particularly maybe the new ones that are represented um, in the exhibit that you want to highlight for us. Yeah, and I think for me, what was so in important about this work is, you know, again, um, you know, artists who are um, playing with language and decision making and, you know, by including a lot of people um, in an event or that requires our audience participation, such as, you know, this show, um, you really can create a dialogue um, with a lot of different perspectives, which I found very interesting, which I feel like was highlighted in a lot of the work. Um, and having them all together, it's almost like they're having a dialogue with one another. Um, and I feel like that's you know something that's really important and unique about this work compared to something that you know is a unified material object. It's something that exists uh, within a community and is also continually building off of each other. But for me, the dialogue is something that's really important because we need to have these critical discussions or reintroduce different ideas through um, emergent form um, to create you know, alternative knowledge um, and how we use computation. And, you know, because it is, it's something that's going to be consistently evolving over time. Um, so, you know, generating new narratives like Fox was mentioning, all these things, you know, are, are going to be really critical um, in the future of our uh, and I'm curious what Fox has to say too. Sure, thanks for uh, yeah, you know, for asking me too. Yeah, so yeah, I, I can answer both in terms of what I see in terms for communities for the artists in the exhibition, and then maybe segue to some of the communities I feel engaged with in my own work. And uh, so Nick earlier was talking about communities oriented around particular types of software practices, whether that's open source software, free software, and uh, more. Yeah. At the same time as when he spoke about the different artists themselves, he alluded to other types of communities, such as where they're situated within different global communities. Yeah. And that might include communities related to issues like gender, race, ethnicity, nationality, and uh, more. And so one way that you know, I like to look at this as, you know, and I think it's, you know, you know, maybe common now to think about intersections between communities, but usually that's more for the kind of social cultural communities. Here, I think we're looking at intersections between those types of communities, as well as different types of software practices. You know, so for example, the difference between festival oriented digital media artists compared to artists who are focused in the gallery, the kind of fine arts scene you know, that, you know, that has software arts involved, but on the periphery quite often and electronic literature as another kind of example. I know Nick is interested in the demo scene and other types of communities. And so I like to really think about how all of those communities intersect and then you know, how they can be generative when you think about these kind of issues. You know, I'm thinking about work like, like I collaborated with Jason Lewis at Concordia and, and other researchers for a workshop on indigenous protocols and artificial intelligence. And that's a kind of example of communities of practice focused on AI coming together with communities that are you know, interested in indigeneity. And then just finally, I'll just say about some of the way that I think about communities. I feel like there are a lot of communities I've been engaged with in terms of AI practice and uh, mathematics, you know, computer science, digital media arts and fine arts and uh, so forth. And one of the reasons I went into academia is that there weren't always places where all of those different constituencies all came together naturally. I think they're increasingly more, but still it, they're underrepresented. And so Nick mentioned the Imagination Computation and Expression Laboratory. I saw that as a place where some of these kinds of issues could come together. Issues of social and cultural analysis, social change, algorithmic representation, meaning and semantics rep representations and the more. And now with the MIT Center for Advanced Virtuality you know, that uh, I was founding director of, started a couple of, year, of years ago here, I look at that as just another opportunity to continue building these kind of 
communities where you bring those kinds of interests into intersection with one another. So you can have people who are interested in pushing the boundaries of virtual reality, augmented reality, other forms of immersive media, synthetic media, but also looking at the latest, say, race and gender critical work and building systems that embody and model those kinds of phenomena within the same unit or access to education in STEM, where you look at students' backgrounds as positive resources for learning and for social change. And so, you know, I just look at this increasing path towards bringing those different concerns together within the same community, finding others who are doing the same, and then providing the opportunities for people here at MIT and more broadly to do that kind of work. Yeah, I think, um, you know, there's uh, a wide range of uh, not just communities, but also we could talk about like literal spaces in terms of sort of architectural spaces or the way that events like festivals, uh, you know, facilitate types of interactions. Um, I think it's important not to forget about that um, as we are in our different circumstances today due to the public health situation and to look forward to how some of those can be restored and improved. You know, Fox uh, uh, came down to uh, Baby Castle's Community Gallery in New York, which has representation in the show and uh, kicked us off for the uh, Synchrony demo party down there. It's, you know, this DIY basement space that's very different than um, the uh, spaces at MIT or at the Design Media Arts Program at UCLA, which is also well represented in the show. Um, so there's this range of different um, opportunities that people have to connect with each other, to learn from each other's practices, uh, to develop work. And I'm uh, just fascinated by um, uh, learning about some of these that you know, fit into the smaller niches, um, not just trying to improve, for instance, you know, what we do at uh, MIT and other you know, top research institutions. Um, just in closing, I do wanna mention that you know, this conversation and sort of having this as a produced video, um, really was done um, explicitly in order to foster community and conversation so that during our opening, instead of um, interrupting everyone by having comments from me and other people, uh, we'd be able to put this out, make it available to you. Um, hopefully, um, I'd love you to be able to, you know, uh, full screen it, turn on the um, uh, closed captions, and watch it at two times speed so you can get through it and you know I'll download it into your brain if you like to do that. Um, and then come to that conversation that we're having, uh, come to the opening and have uh, exchange and discussion with other people. Um, let me see if there's any uh, final remarks that uh, any of you have in the dwindling seconds that we have here. Uh, I just wanted to congratulate all the artists. I know it's it's a hard time to be making work, and it's a really important time to be making work and balance, you know, finding some balance. and And I think all these artists are doing that and opening up really important questions here. That's a very important thing to uh, state, Lauren. Uh, I want to congratulate the artists, thank them for making the work that people can experience in their browsers and also making it available as free Libra open source software. I know that's a part of people's practice that they called out in their bios in some cases, but uh, whether or not they started off that way, um, everybody agreed to it. And um, as a result, we do have that contribution. Right. I would add just All right. in you. line with yeah. your, uh, with just with your, you know, I would add just in line with your congratulations of the artist Lauren and uh, Nick, you know, just to say that I also felt very inspired by the kind of work that the artists produced in all of the terms we mentioned earlier, but we also didn't speak a lot about aesthetics. And I just want to say that there is equally broad array of aesthetic kind of sensibilities in the work from 3D CGI, which is almost video game like, to more info viz work, you know, to more kind of critical, you know, you know, radical, socially engaged artwork to glitch art. And so I feel like there's just such a wide array of aesthetic sensibilities that are represented along with the social, <laughs> along with the social kind of possibilities, along with the political possibilities, along with the communities, you know, that I just found it really 
inspiring to work with uh, you, Sarah, to, to work with you, Sarah, Lauren, and Nick and Prague on this, and then of course just engage with the work of these uh, artists. That's well said. And again, thank you to all the artists and. Um, you know, it's a, such an incredible time to make work and also a very challenging time. And uh, it's important that we continue to make work that analyzes and critiques these structures. And thank you so much. All right. And thanks once again to uh, you three and to Parag for uh, the work um, on the jury to figure out um, which of the uh, very large number of good submissions we had. Uh, would be able to end up uh, in this generative unfoldings exhibit and uh, the new work that we'd be able to get. All right, uh, thanks much. And um, we'll look forward to the opening.